I really want to thank you for the time that you have carved out for me um, today. What I want to really convey to you all is um, what inspires me to make the work that I make. Um, I'm going to intersperse some personal details, um, but I really don't want to sit here and survey everything I've made. Um, I really want to speak to um, what I think it is that shaped me into who I am as an artist right now. Um, so, and I'm going to start um, with a few excerpts from Karen Barad's Meeting the Universe Halfway, um, which actually was a, an optional reading um, for tonight that was available on the website. And um, I really don't want to sit here and give the paper, or I don't think I'm qualified to do that in any way. Um, it was really sort of a touchstone, um, and as well as Haraway's Situated Knowledges, which was another optional reading for tonight, available again on the website. Um, Haraway is a huge interlocutor for Barad, and I will quote quite a bit of Barad, but I want to make it clear that I have, you know, you don't need to have read anything um, to, to um, listen to this talk. Um, I just want to make it clear that I'm not going to give you what I would consider a complete picture uh, of a gentle realism. Um, and I don't want to give you the idea that I'm making work explicitly out of this idea um, that I'm going to share with you. It's um, really, I don't want to assume that capacity. I think, um, I know in the abstract I say that I want to, uh, I wanted to talk about situated knowledges and agential realism, but I feel like when I started to put that talk together, it was uh, really reliant on, on those texts way too much. And I wanted to make this, like I said, again, what it means to me as an artist. Um, and I, you know, Chris introduced me, he said I have a dual practice. I am um, a writer, but, um, I really wanted to bring up Barad because she harnesses um, all the issues, all the implications that uh, a lot of the, the other thinkers um, and artists that have influenced me, she really puts a frame around it or, or a non-frame, whatever. I'll really explain a little bit more later. But if I do want to, you know, sort, if I want to dig deep and see where I think um, all of my ideas got their foundation. It would have to be in the punk, the folk, and the blues music that I was introduced to and grew up with. Um, I think, you know, reading Marx and David Harvey, Althusser, Gambin, Zizek, um, even fiction writers like Haruki Murakami, Philip K. Dick, um, you know, all of these, these things sort of seeded the idea um, that that Barad really solidified for me. Um, so among other things, Barad gives me uh, a strategy or a way to talk about my strategies um, as an artist in terms of her linked epistemology and ontology. Um, that is the way um, knowledge production comes to produce uh, meaning and matter and uh, existence and vice versa. One does not precede the other. Um, they produce each other at the same time, which is really to overgeneralize it. And I get back to, you know, this thing I will say is as an artist, this is my interpretation as an artist, because like I tried to say earlier, I have a level of responsibility within my academic writing to, um, to stay true to a certain academic form. Um, but it's as an artist that I can start to perform what I see as my own interactions um, with what Barad calls phenomena. And, you know, what people refer to as stuff and things and everything, um, that's what she means by phenomena. So I, I want to start to account for the things in the world, um, you know, with the, the lens that she, she provides. Um, it really, the swirling thoughts um, that I've developed throughout my life. Uh, I'm really able to articulate through her coherent argument. 
read a quote here. The, the agential realist understanding that I propose is a non-representationalist form of realism that's based on an ontology that does not take for granted the existence of words and things, and an epistemology that does not subscribe to a notion of truth based on their correct correspondence. So, she goes on a little bit later in the, in the text. Um, this actually isn't in any section that I gave you to read, but knowing is not about seeing from above or outside, even seeing from a prosthetically enhanced human body. Knowing is a matter of interacting, Knowing entails specific practices through which the world is differentially articulated and accounted for. Knowing is not a bounded or closed practice, but an ongoing performance of the world. Humans are neither pure cause nor pure effect, but part of the world in its open-ended becoming. Um, I got my first camera when I was around four or five years old, and I always loved taking pictures. Um, I was bestowed a laundry list of privileges throughout my life, um, two of which always um, constitute my advantaged identity in this country, that is being white and male. Um, in addition to that, I had a family with the means and the desire to support anything that I wanted to do. Um, it's not that I've not had to work, or it's not that I have not worked hard in my life, but I recognize that I have never needed to work as hard as other people. For example, women of my same race and economic status, people of color with my same gender, or anyone living below the poverty line. So the overfunded public high school that I attended, um, I took what was called an art concentration, um, where I was able to drop math and foreign language and to take advanced placement photography and studio art classes. So I was able to there experiment with painting, sculpture, but I really mainly focused on taking pictures. Um, and pictures of landscapes, of girls, um, trying to get them to take off as much clothes as they could. A, a typical patriarchal crap. Um, I was really out to capture, and I think I was sort of insidiously, um, you know, slowly, gradually trained to try and capture some truth of beauty. Um, I got my first computer when I was 10 years old, which seems really sort of ancient when you think about today, toddlers see a photograph, a printed photograph, and try and perform a gesture on it, and then exclaim that it's broken. But um, that actually happens. But I did have the economically privileged access to technology growing up. I had a two-way pager in 1995 when I was nine years old. Um, I actually got called down to the principal's office because I thought I was selling drugs, but um, no one I knew had uh, another one, so I only contacted my father. Um, I wrote down my homework assignments in it and stored my friend's birthdays and stuff. Um, so fast forward through a lot of different devices, handhelds, computers, film scanners, digital cameras, and we get to a point where I'm in undergrad um, calling myself a photographer and I have a crisis with photography. I realize that everything I have done with a camera to this point has perpetuated this truth of vision. Um, and this is around 2005, 2006. So I, I briefly try to take photography elsewhere um, beyond this truth of vision, um, sort of um, using oversaturation and things to get to what I, what I think I was going for was something like a phenomenological uh, truth to photography. But again, it's this, this search for truth that I really um, was the problem. So I was unsatisfied with photography altogether. I completely abandoned the still camera. Um, and I moved in the direction of fabricating experiential multimedia installations, um, really trying to get at something visceral because you know, if you can't, if seeing isn't enough, then I thought feeling, you know, we got to, if, if I can elicit some sensation in the body, some physiological sort of response, then, you know, I can get to this truth. Um, but, um, so I made this, that practice. <coughs> You know, in hindsight, I really actually like this project a lot more. I, I thought it was a complete failure. Um, 
at the time because it really um, didn't do what I thought I wanted it to do, but really, in hindsight, it was a pretty damn good project. <laughs> but after that, after that failure, or this, what I deemed as a failure, I wrote a um, manifesto. So I assume the end of the world um, by, or, you know, the end of the world as we know it, um, by way of ecological disaster. Um, and then I generated work that represented the way I would respond to that assumed future. Um, and it was really dark uh, work, you know, and if it was expressive at all, it really only expressed my struggle um, to communicate with, with people, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I was trying to create a reality an alternate, you know, if here I was trying to create a reality in and of itself that was, that was generated viscerally and that didn't happen, then I said to myself, okay, I'll write a manifesto and create an alternate reality. And then that reality can be compared to this one because there's nothing I can do to this one. You know, that's where I was stuck. There's nothing I can do to the world to, to make any change. So I'll make another one and I'll make world or work from that world. Um, so, I dug myself into a hole. Um, I was making art from an ideology where artists were useless, essentially. Um, and that's why none of the work really, none of the, well, I'm not showing you any of it here, but, you know, it's, it's part of my struggle to how I became who I am today. Um, I had amazing friends, colleagues, instructors guiding me um, along the way, but and it really helped me climb out of that hole, but it wasn't until I read Barad that I saw a way of dealing with the impenetrability of uh, the structure that I wanted to engage with. The, it was only by refiguring ontology and epistemology, only by linking being and, and knowledge that I saw any agency, I saw any opportunity for any agency. So. I'm interested in taking a, a, this. so where did this lead me? It, it led me to an interest in taking a tool that perpetuates the truth of vision, that sight is knowledge, and asking that tool to decenter the way it sees. So what might this device, its software, this device, this phone, be taking from me uh, when it brings the problems of photography to the realm of communication. Um, specifically, the Cartesian division between the internal and the external. Me, as a, a knowing subject, and over there, the object of my investigation. You know, how, how do I, if that's what this tool is replicating, how do I subvert that? How do I um, make it do something else? Um, So I've worked a lot with um, the iPhone, um, like I said, but specifically an iPhone application called AutoStitch, um, which is designed very specifically. Its purpose, at least as I see it, um, or as I have come to engage with it, is to take the limitations of the iPhone camera. That is, you know, if, we, if I was sitting here, I could only take so much of the room at a time, and, and to, you know, allow that, to expand that frame to really perpetuate this truth of vision. So the instructions, it comes with a very specific set of instructions. You stand in one place and you move the camera around. And based on that uh, positioning, it will arrange those photos into a panorama for you without your, your doing it. If you happen to, to move around the space, um, which I was experimenting with, not just staying in one place, but if you move around the space, um, the application doesn't have the ability to put three dimensions into two dimensions. So all you essentially end up with is a, a mix of photos taken from different angles. It doesn't, nothing magical happens. The, the, the application, even if you, if you do get it to actually take it, because most of the time it will just say, I can't align these, but if you do get them to actually take it, it's not anything more than if you just layered a few uh, photographs randomly. So 
um, I wanted to really try and get this thing to break down uh, the truth of vision that I feel like is perpetuated by the classical panorama. Um, so the first project I wanted to I want to share with you where I use this um, took over, took place over the course of three days, um, and myself, uh, Joshua Reinstein, and Matthew Leal, um, two pe or one. Josh, I collaborate with frequently, and Matt, this was the first and only time. Um, we brought objects that we keep in our uh, studios for the purpose of making sculpture installation. We brought them all to the same place. Um, and the activity we engaged with in is what I would call a sort of collaborative exercise. Um, we rigorously rearranged them, like I said, eight hours a day for three days, and developed um, several iterations. We never Really, st I mean, we stopped at the end of the the eight hours, but it it wasn't because something had been completed. It was just that was the time to stop for the day. So we went back for three days um, till we had worked 24 hours, just creating several iterations. Um, we seem to have a common yet unspoken goal of uh, assembling something really uh, completely unmonumental. And I, I. I'm sure some of you are familiar with the catalog and the exhibition on Monumental, which we were definitely um, heavily inspired by. Um, you know, if I may go off a little bit, I think the materials that we, we had and that we brought together really um, mimicked a lot of the materials, the everyday materials that you would see in that exhibition. But because that exhibition occurred and because that that catalog was disseminated, essentially what we were doing, um, every, t every time I took a photograph, essentially what I was doing was creating a monument to the unmonumental. So, you know, if, if, you know, what capturing that with a still photograph, and I took about 100, all it did was create, you know, you had images of, of nothing that didn't create a something. Um, and that's the idea behind Unmonumental, is, is something from nothing. So, you know, nothing from nothing is what really happened because of, of the, the discourse that we were making the work in. So, documentation is really important to me though. So, because I know I could, can't necessarily capture the work necessarily, I, I see it as an opportunity to reiterate the work. So, for example, this. I mean, this is the original piece of the bridge. And when I was asked to, to put it here, I saw it as an opportunity to reiterate the work. And whatever, if something is sacrificed or something is lost, then I have to, to work around that in order to, to really to take the opportunity. Because at the end of the day, it's about opportunities. You know, why I make is to share. I, I make nothing for myself. Um, I make it, you know, I enjoy it very much, but I am in a constant struggle to, to communicate with other people. That's really what it's, you know, what it's about. It's that philosophy behind the song that I played in the beginning. Um, I can't do it when I'm gone, so I have to do it while I'm here. So at the time of the exercise, like I said, I'd been playing around with a lot of different iPhone applications um, on my phone and, and found the application Auto Stitch. And I was making the cool looking errors, but all the images just came across gimmicky. They were substanceless. Um, but I did figure out how to trick the camera or trick the device um, while I was experimenting with it. Rather than moving around the space, I realized that if you to change the angle, not the angle, sorry, change the, the distance from which you view the same angle, you, the application understands it, the, the software processes it, because it's not, you're essentially only changing the scale, and it can deal with a change in scale, it can't deal with a change in position. Um, So, um, um, 
So after really setting out to trick this thing into doing something else, um, and remembering that while I was, I was creating these 100 images that were complete failures, they didn't convey anything, they had nothing to do with what we were doing over those 24 hours, um, the 100 images I captured. So what I did was climb up and down a 12-foot ladder um, and took pictures of the, the final iteration of the piece, which is where we took everything as fast as we could and just laid it all out on the floor. So we laid everything out on the floor, I climb up and down the ladder um, and take photos as I'm doing it. Um, and eventually I get this. So this image is not the residue of the collaborative experience. It's not the, the just documentation of uh, the event. You know, the whole time I've been talking about this, I haven't been calling it an artwork because it wasn't. It was an exercise. And out of the exercise comes this work because the, the representation, what's represented here or what happens is the, the fluidity by which these disparate objects came together over the course of those 24 hours to create different meanings, you know, different figurations is captured here in the fluidity. You know, the, none of these objects right now are rendered as they were um, in real space. You know, the, the truth is somewhere in between the, the or there is no truth, but the, what's created here in the viewing of this is somewhere in between a, a knowing subject and the object of study. It's, it's created at the site between them. And I argue that I'm doing this um, with diffractive practices. So diffraction, according to Barad, involves a reading of insights through one another that help illuminate the differences as they emerge. So I'm forcing a device programmed to represent a single perspective to account for multiple perspectives. Um, multiple conflicting representations of space um, processed through this device uh, render it as fluid. So the meaning is generated through their, their discursivity. Um, so there are over 100 billion photographs on Facebook. Um, that number is increasing by more than 200. Uh, 60 photographs per second are uploaded to Instagram. There are 51 million registered users of Flickr and more than five billion people moved a, used a mobile phone last year. So the reason I use this device is because it's becoming uh, a tool of communication. And I want to talk really quick, I want to share, you know, this is the last um, section of the talk and then I really want to open it up for discussion, tease out a lot of the stuff that I'm sure I'm confusing you with. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about is um, something that a futurist who works for Intel, um, he's a futurist and a principal engineer, he works for Intel and he came to CCA last year and gave a lecture to the design department, I believe it was, um, where he shared something that Intel was doing. Um, he, he shared what they were doing, but not really how they were doing it. So what I'm about to give you is really a general, uh, uh, I'm not, I don't understand the science behind it or the technology behind it because that's obviously very closed. But what he did explain was um, what is going to be able, what is going to be, what the potential is for the software that they're currently developing. So um, what it'll do Rather than, you'll be able to take an image 
and feed it through this, this software such that it will generate um, symbolic determiner, like lingu language, to apply to that uh, photo. We've all tagged a photo, or maybe some of us have, some of us haven't, tagged a photo online, titled a photo, captioned a photo, and we understand that that process of tagging or, or putting those symbols onto the photograph determines how that photograph is going to be accessed, is going to be you know, used in the creation of meaning, um, it's going to be disseminated. So what this will do is essentially take out the human element of that. The, the human element will only be in the programming. The algorithm will do the linguistic determination of what that photograph is. So that rather than, you know, the 80 million, 80, I'm sorry, 80 billion photographs that are now owned by Facebook can be fed through this, this device and all re-tagged essentially by the, with the symbols that the software deems appropriate. So what happens when we do away with language in the formation of the archive? Um, when tagging becomes based on algorithms instead of our own free will. Um, and what happens to the process of symbolic representation when it's enacted outside of us, um, you know, in our daily experience, you know, rather than um, exchanging that photo with our own desired uh, tags, we're able to, or they will have their uh, hegemonic structure. There'll be a system by which those uh, identifying characteristics are always predetermined, essentially. Um, so that's not the only thing that can happen with this software. You can also take a photograph and use it to search for photographs. So you don't even need to, to input your own uh, symbolic representation. You don't need to use your own language. You just, you know, you perpetuate that you take a photo of something, this water bottle, and you find every photo of every crystal geyser water bottle ever made. Um, you take a photograph of your house, you know, which was built in the 1950s, and you see every photograph of your house um, that was ever taken all based on the unique uh, material characteristics of it. So this, we're talking about identification far beyond anything that we could do. You know? So I'm not, uh, I don't have a, an opinion on this. I'm not saying this is going to be the end of the world, it's going to be the end of anything. But, um, and it doesn't even exist yet, so it's not like we have any uh, you know, things put into praxis that we can examine. But we can, you know, think about it theoretically. Um, and I mean, it's, it's not even just the 80 billion photos on Facebook. It's it's every image that has ever been taken, as soon as the software comes out, becomes reinscribed based on um, you know the program, based on the algorithm. So you know my the work, the images that I'm going to share with you um, are from what I consider an expanded photographic practice. Um, in the same vein or same sort of line as the previous image I showed you of the, the exercise. So this work is a product of my thinking, you know, in the bridge, is a product of my thinking about the transition from symbolic representations enacted by the user uh, to a symbolic representation enacted by the device. Um, so I'm trying to uncover new media strategies to undermine um, the assumed power of division or of vision that 
will get that this, you know, truth of photography, this software um, brings with it. So, you want to turn the lights up for me, right behind me? <coughs> so this is the uh, second piece in the bridge series, and all the photos that I am going to show you now are Obviously, I wouldn't present them on a projection um, in a gallery setting. They, I'm working with dissecting televisions, um, you know, building new enclosures for them, um, and working with uh, animation and video to really um, do something like this with these photographs as well. Um, really push the. The non-fixity, you know, that that it never uh, comes into full resolution. There's always multiple uh, layers interacting. Um, this projector isn't the crispest either. So this one is called Sunflowers. Um, This one is actually 400 photos um, at once. And all of these are created by different sort of layering processes. Um, the train too. And um, I did take them all. However, um, in this last one that I'm going to show you, um, I'm starting to work with not just images that I have taken, but images from archives and um, yeah, taking it elsewhere. Um, I feel like I botched a little bit, um, got a little nervous, but I really thank you for your time. Um, and I really would love to sit and... Uh, Answer any questions that you might have. Keep talking. You know, clarify anything that I might have stumbled over. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.